Well, welcome to Christ Church. Good to see you all today. Thankful for your commitment to be here. I uh, did my normal stuff last night and it did not go well on the timing of the service. So just open your Bible. <laughs> open your Bible. No, seriously, open your Bible right now. We gotta go, we got a lot to do. And we're gonna be in 1 Timothy chapter number three. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, maybe you're a guest with us, I'm Adam. We're super thankful you're here. We have a Bible for you to borrow and uh, page 932 will get you to 1 Timothy. Meet us there and uh, we're gonna be in big number three, chapter number three. We're gonna start there, a new chapter today. Glad to have you with us. We're going line by line, paragraph by paragraph through this little letter in the New Testament. It's from an apostle who is a special messenger from Jesus Christ, who saw the risen Christ. Paul is his name. He wrote it to a pastor. His name's Timothy. That's why the letter's called 1 Timothy or 1 Timothy. Timothy got two of these, and Timothy is the lead pastor at a church in Ephesus, which is a Greek city in the first century that was quite the cosmopolitan center. So that's what we're doing. We're going line by line and paragraph by paragraph, and we're allowing God, through the word of the apostle, we're allowing Jesus, the head of the church, to organize us, to put things in order, to give us the house rules. The way our family lives as a local church family is directly under the authority of this letter, and uh, this is a key part of our life being ordered by Christ who rescued us and who purchased us as his people. So this is not ours to make up. We're not trying to make up the church. We're not trying to figure it out on our own. We're not using or borrowing from the culture around us to try to organize it and be what we're supposed to be because this is what somebody says is good. We want the apostolic word to be delivered to us and to help us, to shape us so that we will be what we've been called to be. Now, as we begin chapter number three today, I just want to draw back your memory to maybe something. Have you ever wanted someone to be on your team? You wanted someone until you got the someone that you got, and then you're like, not that one. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? And you're like, you know, I think, I think our office really needs one more person. And then you met the person that was the one more person. You're like, I think our office needs one less person to be really efficient Listen, church leadership is like that. It is not just a bunch of someones. We cannot just have anyone or just someone or just a group of someones because church leadership is always plural. Just be the leaders of our local church. It's got to be specific. It's got to be a certain kind. It's got to be very dialed in and not dialed in by any of our standard, but dialed in through the word of God to what is delivered to us in places. There are a bunch of them, but places like 1 Timothy chapter number 3. The stakes are very high for the leadership of the local church. It's all delegated leadership. Jesus Christ is the head of Christ's church. It's his. It's not just his name on the sign. He's actually the authority over us. And he delegates authority among us that reports to him, that is under him, and that can be assessed by all of us because he's given us his word to define those delegated leaders among us. The stakes are very high because the gospel is intended to go out as we, the church, scatter into the community in which God has placed us. So the enemy of God is actively pursuing the downfall of leadership within the local church. And many of you are carrying the scars of the downfall of leadership in the local church. It's a very real part of many of our stories. The bigger the influence For Christ in the leadership of the local church, the bigger the target from the enemy to defame and to denigrate the glorious good news of the gospel and the name of Jesus Christ. The higher the responsibility in the local church for the leadership delegated by Jesus, the more dramatic the crash if that leadership fails and falls. The louder the voice in the church for the sake of the church, the greater the impact of the hypocrisy if uncovered in the life of that voice. It's a sobering part of the reality of the leadership of the local church. The stakes are high. The issues are real. And we need God's word to define leadership for us. Christ died for the church. The delegated leadership are merely under shepherds, under the chief shepherd, Jesus. So make no mistake, the calling and the demands and the sustaining grace for local church leadership 
is immeasurably high. So if you're taking notes this morning, before we dive into this, we're going to call it church leadership. Pastors, that's because this week is pastors. Next week, Lord willing, will be church leadership and deacons. We'll dig into the next section that comes up in chapter number three and discuss what God says to us about the two offices of the local church, the pastors and the deacons. So let's read the word. We're gonna read verses one through seven. You got your eyes on it. If you're joining in online, glad you're with us. Church family, we miss you. And uh, if you're kicking the tires, welcome. Hope it'll lead to you visiting with us. Everybody get your eyes on the Bible online, if you can, if that's possible, and uh, here in the room as well. And let's read it. I'll read it out loud. You follow along silently and remember as we read that these are God's words to us, the spirit of God who superintended Paul to write them to Timothy for Ephesus intended for us to have them today and for them to be just as authoritative for Christ church in 2023. Okay, here we go. Verse one, the saying is trustworthy. That's one of Paul's little phrases he likes that sets up a big phrase. He uses it a couple times in 1 Timothy and once in 2 Timothy. The saying is trustworthy. Here it is. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. He must not be, for, oh, sorry, verse five, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. These are the words of God for us this morning. May the spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten by them. Now, before we dive in, I think this is another opportunity for a bunch of us to say, well, this isn't about me. This isn't for me. And it absolutely is for you. If you're a follower of Christ, this is for you. This is very important for your own discipleship. Let me tell you why. You were intended as a Christ follower living on the mission of Christ to live within the relationships of a local assembly of the church, a local expression in which you're sitting in one of them. So this is important because the under leadership under Christ as the chief shepherd is very important to your relationship to the local church. Secondly, leadership in the local church is exemplary. It is modeling. So what we're going to find almost entirely about the leadership being defined by God in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is also what is called for and what the Spirit intends for your life and for my life. This is across the board. There's only a, one exception, and I'll show that to you, but everything else is a part of what the Spirit of God intends to do through the exemplary, through the example of leadership for our discipleship. So as you engage with this, let's be reminded of what our discipleship is intended to produce in our lives as the Spirit of God has our hearts and changes us through the gospel power that's at work in us. Okay, does that make sense? So here's the big idea. It's gonna be really simple. It's gonna hold over the next two weekends. The Bible clearly defines the standards of leadership for the church. Not the culture, not the loudest voices, not the smartest people, not those who have the most influence in some kind of other way in the community. Only God himself through his word defines the standards for the leadership. So I wanna give you five baseline standards for the pastors the first office that's here for the pastors of Christ church and any church that is truly following Christ and his word. So if you're jotting them down, our pastors must all have these five baseline standards. You ready? All right, let's go. Number one, our pastors must all have leadership aspiration for us. The first baseline standard in this exemplary leadership is an aspiration to do the leadership for us. So Paul begins by saying, the saying is trustworthy, setting up a very important moment for Timothy, the lead pastor at the church at Ephesus, as he outlines now what is to be considered very carefully. He says in verse one, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, He desires a noble 
task. And that parallelism there is really important. The aspiration, the aspiring is the wanting of something, the heart movement toward it. I'd like to do that. I want to do that. It's not under compulsion. It's not forced to. It's not have to. It's I want to. And it's the office. It's the responsibility role of overseer. And that is parallel to the noble. What's the last word in verse one? The noble what? Task. That's a good work. It's work. And this is important, especially for young people who say, I think I want to be a pastor someday. Uh, Maybe you're uh, in that category. It is the aspiration for the office that comes with the work. So it is not merely an office. It is the engagement in the actual leadership for us as a church family. It's reaching out for it. It's desiring it. And that is the first biblical baseline standard. Now, let me just give you a quick note here because maybe you noticed the word overseer and I'm using the word pastor. The word overseer is bishop, by the way, in the New Testament, bishop and elder and pastor. Those are three different terms. They're used in the Bible and they are used interchangeably about one office. The bishop, depending on your tradition that you come from into this meeting right now, perhaps you have a different understanding of that. Overseer, bishop, Elder and pastor are all the same office. It's just different titles used for the same role and a different expression of that role. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, all three of those are used at the same time. Peter says, hey, as, a, as an elder, I'm writing to you elders. It's always plural, by the way, always plural elders for the church. It's a plurality. He says, I'm an elder. And then he says, shepherd the flock of God among you. Shepherd is pastor, pastor of the church, exercising oversight. That's bishop overseeing. That's the three concepts wrapped up into one passage in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. You can also see this laid out in Titus 1, verses 5 through 9, and in Acts chapter 20, verses 20. 4 to 28. So you have all kinds of opportunity to see it. Once you know it's there, you can easily identify these as the same office as you study your New Testament. Now, that's only important because he says that that oversight is a noble work. And the work of the pastoral team that must be the leadership aspiration by those who carry that office and do that work is laid out for us in the New Testament. So I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this. We have so much to do this morning. But I do want you to know that we're coming up on Paul laying out for Timothy in chapter 5 that ruling and teaching are two primary functions of the pastors, of the bishops, of the elders of the local church. Ruling and teaching, praying for the flock, James brings in chapter 5 as a key aspect of our life. Caring for the flock, which I just quoted to you from 1 Peter 5 verses 1 and 2. And ordaining other church leaders, we'll see in 1 Timothy chapter number 4 when we get there. All of that it is involved in, and much more, the work of the oversight of the leadership of our pastors. Now, I want to give you a couple phrases. Maybe if you're taking notes, uh, these could be helpful Uh, They're phrases we use a lot as a pastoral team. I just want you to know what the aspiration is toward, okay? We use the phrase equal in essence, diverse in function. Equal in essence means that we plurally share the responsibility for this flock. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says that we are gonna give an answer for the care of the souls of this flock that's gathered here in one local expression. Equal in essence means we share that collectively. Diverse in function means that we live out our role as pastors, as bishops, as elders, unique to our scope and scale, gifting, time, bandwidth, uh, season of life. All of that is the diverse in function. Does that make sense? Equal in essence, diverse in function, which also lends itself then to a second phrase. We put an emphasis on macro and micro Pastoring. Pastoring is not all one size fits all. Shepherding, the care for the flock and oversight of the flock comes in macro and micro. There are those who are uh, serving in twos and fours and six and eight and 12 people at a time as they engage with them, shepherding them. And there are those of us who are responsible for engaging with 700 of us at a time. So that's macro and micro, both equal in essence, but diverse in function. One last thing I want you to know is what we're actually overseeing as the bishop, elder, pastoral team that we are. And there are three 
categories that we use to oversee and to be faithful to our responsibility. The first is doctrine. They're alliterated. Are you surprised? Doctrine, direction, and discipleship are the three categories that we're watching over and influencing and being a part of as a pastoral team. Our leadership aspiration is an aspiration to this work. This is the noble work to look over and to protect and to teach the doctrine of the church, to oversee at the 40,000 foot level, the direction of our church and where it's going and to be very involved in the discipleship of our church and how we are growing. Those are the three primary responsibilities. So the desire, the aspiration is for the work rather than for the status of the title or the power that might be perceived in the title and the office or the perceived benefits that we might think are there socially. Whatever that is, it's not to be what is actually underneath of our aspiration. It is the work of caring for the flock of Jesus Christ. In fact, when I say this, I think some of you immediately get a little hung up on the word overseer because that means you're being watched. We're watching you. (laughs) And that doesn't feel great, does it? We don't like it to be, we don't like being watched. That's not our thing. That's not what we enjoy. And I appreciate that. I'm with you in that. So I want you, if the spirit would be so kind, I want us to shift the way we think about this, not as being observed and being controlled. This is not for control. The chief shepherd has under shepherds in each local congregation, not for the control of the flock, but think of shepherds watching over sheep. And the key word is the protection of the flock. That's a different concept. Now oversight is to watch out for destruction for the flock, to watch out for poison that would affect the flock, to watch out for the flock hurting the flock. This is the oversight that Paul speaks of here. In fact, we talk about it as a team. We're shepherd sheep. We're like player coaches. We're in the flock and we're shepherds for the flock under the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. We need it as well. We need to be protected and overseen in the doctrine, direction, and discipleship of our lives through the team that is serving together for the sake of our entire church family. Does this make sense? You understand what I'm saying here? Not everyone should aspire to the office of overseer, of bishop, pastor, elder. But those who do must aspire to the work of the role and the spirit of God's movement will always lend itself there if we will take this passage seriously. That's the first baseline standard. Are you tracking with me? Thumbs up if you're with me. You seeing what I'm seeing? Okay, good. This is a little bit, This is a little bit uncomfortable. Like last week in chapter two, it's uncomfortable but not unclear because I'm one of them and now I'm preaching about it and you're looking at me. (laughs) So I feel all that. So here we go, number two, baseline standard. Our pastors must all have personal qualification among us. Personal qualification among us and that is to be an observable part of the life of our pastoral team. So let's dig into verse two and verse three where that list is given to us. And let me note first that when we get to verse two and it says, therefore an overseer, a bishop must be above reproach. That is not the first in the list. That is the overarching one over the list. The above reproach is like an umbrella category of qualification. That means that as followers of Jesus Christ, because the spirit of God has transformed our hearts, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we have matured and developed and are being grown by the spirit of God's work in us and life together as a family, so much so that there is not an opportunity for accusation to stick against those who serve as the pastors of Christ church. This is an unstickability. The literal concept here is that they cannot be accused. You cannot arrest them and hold them on a charge because the charge doesn't stick to the life that has been seen, there's no way that holds up. We know them, that is an outlier, that is not a pattern. You can't stick that to their life. That's what above reproach means. And everything under above reproach is what we're gonna study for the rest of our time. So this is a category that's above. To be below reproach means that you can throw accusations and people go like, yeah, I can see that. That's probably true. If that's the case, there is a growth that needs to take place before there's this responsibility to under shepherd, under the chief shepherd for the sake of the flock, okay? This is gospel stuff. 
Let me tell you right now, above reproach does not mean sinless. Please, it doesn't mean sinless. We're not sinless. We're sinful people. We're walking in repentance. We're confessing sin. We're in a battle with our flesh. We're walking in the spirit. We're pursuing the truth to set us free. Like we're not sinless. But rather there's not a pattern of sin that would allow glue to build up on our life so that there could be an accusation that would stick of a pattern that would undermine the gospel power and discredit the name of Jesus Christ. Understand? Amen, if you understand. Okay, all right. Now let's get into what those qualifications are. There's 10 of them that are personally qualifying the leadership of Christ Church as a pastoral team. The first one is the husband of one wife, which literally is a one woman man. It's a one woman man. This is not merely a prohibition against polygamy. This is not merely a one at a time man. This is a character moral issue that identifies those who should be leading because the spirit of God has worked in them so much so that they treasure and value the covenant of marriage between one woman and one man as God designed. This is not even teaching that every pastor in our church has to be married, but all of them have to be one woman men because they treasure and value and hold the covenant of marriage as God intended in high priority, not just with their words, not just with their mind, but with their life. That's what's going on here. That's the first category. This does not require marriage. Jesus was not married, and I'm pretty sure he'd make it as an elder at Christ Church. Okay. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this, was not married. And I'm sure that if he became a prospect here, we'd be like, thumbs up, we think he should be one of us. (laughs) This is a moral qualification that clearly identifies those who have grown in the gospel grace as the Spirit of God has worked in them to be the high value treasuring of the covenant of marriage, husband of one wife, one woman, man. Whether that one woman has been met yet or not, there is a value on the covenant. Number two, sober-minded. That is with clear judgment and wisdom. Some of you are counting the days of your sobriety. I love that for you. You are on the other side of an addiction that has held you down. This is not that sobriety. That's coming up in a minute. This is more of a sound judgment, the ability to use your mind well, to have the wisdom from above versus the wisdom from below, James chapter three in your New Testament, to apply and to carefully influence under the spirit of God's direction. That's what sober-minded is. Self-controlled is a disciplined life with that sober mind. Those are overlapping concepts. That is a disciplined life that is spirit-led. Romans chapter eight, if you haven't been in Romans eight recently, get there. It's all about our lives as God's people being spirit-led. We start to become more and more self-controlled because the spirit of God has more and more of ourself. The third one is respectable. That is orderly. That's what that word is conveys orderly living, worthy of the respect of others. It is not an out of order or a disordered life that ought to be held up as an example for the flock under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The fifth one is is hospitable. That is the welcome of all people and all kinds of people into our lives. There's just an openness. There's an openness with our home and with our resources and with our person. There's an openness to all kinds of people. That's hospitality that is hospitable. Now, listen, hey, we've got five of them and all five of them are just Christian stuff. That's all that is. Like the the leadership in the local church is to be exemplary as the spirit of God leads and directs and develops those followers of Christ, those men who will carry this responsibility is to set before us a one woman man kind of life or a one man kind of woman life. It is to set before us a sober mindedness and a judgment that is informed by God's truth. It is a self-control that's led by the spirit. It's a respectability because we order our lives as gospel people so that the mission of Christ advances and it's hospitality, the openness of our lives. This is all in the New Testament for all of us. So as you consider this, this is not 
them and us kind of an idea. This is us, but those who would be given the responsibility to care for our souls in our church family must be those who exemplify this so that we follow their leadership under the leadership of Jesus Christ who accomplishes this. Now, number six is the only exception. Number six is at the end of verse number two, and it is able to teach. That is a Holy Spirit gifting that is in all of those who will serve as a part of a pastoral team, whether macro or micro, there is the ability to bring God's word to bear on God's people because one of the primary functions in the work is to teach the body. There must be a spirit gifting to teach. Not a one size fits all, but it is present in all and it is unique to the office. So one to five in those descriptions are for all of us. Able to teach is uniquely for the pastoral team. Now, Paul moves in verse three into the negatives, okay? Now we're back to his list, not a drunkard. Technically, in the Greek language, that means not a drunkard. (laughs) It means not being drunk. This is a very clear prohibition throughout your entire Bible. The assumption of alcohol is also all through your Bible. But the unwillingness to allow alcohol to be changing the way I think or losing the control of myself because alcohol has taken it, chemicals have taken control, is all through your Bible. In fact, if you're taking notes, Ephesians chapter five and verse 18 says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's not to leadership. That's to all of us because this is our life. When you just want to, you just want to finally have a little bit of rest, do not go to drunkenness. Trust the Spirit of God who brings rest to your soul. When you need some comfort and you want to be numbed to the pain, do not go to drunkenness. Allow the Spirit of God to comfort you with the promises of God that are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. When you need courage and calm, do not allow drunkenness to be the way that you get to be someone you're not. Trust the Spirit of God to move you toward the mission of Christ with the boldness that you need. Not a drunkard. The leadership, as exemplary leadership in the church family, cannot be sticky to be pinned with a description of drunkenness on our lives. That's number seven. Here's number eight. Not violent, but gentle. And some of the old, some of the old translations said not strikers. Like hitting people. Like that's, I just want you to know at Christ Church, our pastoral team, we don't hit people. Okay. That's not okay. We're not all right with that. Uh, not, not violent actually means that. It's like aggression. It's angry outbursts of aggression. And if you don't think this is still a part of a problem inside of the local church, then you are misunderstanding what's going on in this battle against our flesh. This cannot become a pattern. This cannot be the pattern of life. There needs to not be a violent pattern, but a gentle pattern. A kindness and a care for others is necessary without the violence of being a striker. Number nine goes right with it, not quarrelsome, not argumentative, not postured in a way that sets up a fight in every conversation. What God intends for Christ's church is not to have a pastoral team where when you wanna bring a concern, when you have a question, when you need to engage in something that's difficult, you don't, you don't lean back while you're asking. You don't say it and kind of lean back. One, because they're gonna swing at you. You're like, no. I got hit by an elder last week. I'm not doing that again. No. And it shouldn't be that you're leaning back because you know when you interact with the elders at Christ Church, you just get an argument. They put you down. They try to dominate you verbally. That's quarreling. That's not to be who we are. We should be easy to come to, reasonable, open to interaction, want to have discussion. We might have disagreement, but it cannot be violent. It has to be gentle and it cannot be quarrelsome. It'll have to be done in the spirit of Christ in a way that would honor and glorify the Christ who saved us. Amen, understand? And this is Christian, not a drunkard. That's Christian. Not violent, but gentle. That's Christian. Not quarrelsome. That's Christian living quiet lives in this community for the sake of being a bright light of the gospel in the darkness in which we live. And lastly, 
Number 10, not a lover of money. Whether rich or poor, I don't know if you know this, but the Bible does not classify pastor and poverty as being one and the same. So whether rich or poor, in Ephesus, where Timothy's leading, no doubt there are pastors on the team. There are bishops, elders on the team who have varying levels of income and resources financially. It is not that there is money. It's that all the money is a stewardship for the one who gave the money as a stewardship. So money is a tool. Money is not a problem. Money is an opportunity for the sake of our lives to be blessed by good gifts from God and to utilize our resources for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But the love of money is the root of all evil for all of us. If you love it, if your affections are all wrapped up in it, it's what you look to for your hope. It's what you long for that would change everything. If it's the idol of your heart, it'll produce all kinds of terrible expressions in our lives of evil. So the exemplary leadership in our church family must not be sticky for the accusation of love of money, but rather stewards of resources that God intends. I don't know if you've ever been in a doctor's office and uh, looked around the room. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people. I sit there on that little paper. I, I hate that. I sit on that little paper table thing. I got this weird gown on that they tied in the back. That's humiliating. I'm trying to tie it tighter. I can't ever get that thing closed all the way. <laughs> I'm looking around the room. I scan the magazine rack. I know every magazine that's in there. I'm looking at some of the instruments. I'm like, can I touch that? Do I have time to touch that before they come back in? I'd like to see how that works. Have you ever been in there? You're in a doctor's office and there's no certificates on the wall? Problem. Problem. Those certificates are how I know you have earned the right to look at me this way. Otherwise, this conversation's over. Now listen. When it comes to leadership in the church, it's not certificates that should give you confidence. It should not be where we were trained or the education behind us or anything except for the quality of the life that's being lived among us. It's an aspiration to lead for us and it is a qualification personally among us that is the credibility underneath of the under shepherding responsibilities delegated by Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd of Christ church. So you have to relate to us in that way. That's the way it's supposed to work. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse seven. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 are talking to you. First Thessalonians chapter five, talking to you about your interaction with us. It's supposed to be in this framework. Listen, don't borrow from somewhere else and make that how you relate here. We are not the cops. Amen, thank you, thank you. (laughs) It's like you just were startled by that. Wait, they're not? We're not cops. We love the cops. We're not the cops. That's not how you relate. That's not what we're doing here. We're not principals of a school. We're not headmasters. They probably strike people. (laughs) I'm teasing. That'd be a lawsuit. That'd be bad. We're not cops. We're not principals. We're not senators who've been voted in. We're not a board. You'll never hear us talk about ourselves as a board of elders. I know that's common in churches. We do not use that language on purpose. We are not a corporation that has an executive board of directors. That would change the requirements for who's there. We're not a board. And we're not auditors of your life. We're not just always like sneaking around in your business. You know, you're at the checkout at the the grocery store. We're just like, what do you got there? Let's keep an eye on the drunkenness thing, okay? (laughs) That's not how we relate. Like when you do an audit, you have to do it. And you're like, ah, give them the stuff. That's not our relationship. We have a chief shepherd who died for us, amen? amen. He rose for us. We have eternal life, amen? amen? We're on his mission and he's delegated some leaders in every congregation to report directly to him to be accountable to the whole flock for the oversight of that particular local assembly of his people. And this is how it's gotta be. It can't just be someone's doing it. It's gotta be a special kind of person that's doing it because the spirit of God is working things out for our benefit. It's a specific defined standard, sobering and humbling to say it. May God help us. That's the second baseline standard, personal qualification among us. Here's number three. We'll go through the last three quickly. Number three, our pastors must all have household administration with us. The longest 
part of this whole qualification discussion is about the home. God's first institution, the home. Look at what he says in verse four. He, the man who would be a part of this team, must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, one, how will he care for God's church made up of many? That is a lesser to the greater argument. If there's one and it's not managed well, how can there be management of many? No, it's very specific. He says, manage his own household well. That word manages to stand before its leadership in the home as God intended. Again, this is not some kind of special class. This is not some kind of special, uh, I don't know, like graduate level Christianity. This is just Christian. This is just husbands and wives. This is just parents and children. This is just a relationship within the home as God intended. And it's got to be there in the leadership of the local church for the example to the local church who are all walking as followers of Christ for the mission of Jesus Christ. If this is a below reproach and you can stick that 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 family situation is out of control, then it would undermine the name of Christ and the gospel of Christ, which has the transforming power to change everything. So the stakes are high and household administration with us is important. Now, I wanna make a note to you who are students of the word. Maybe you could jot down Titus chapter one and verse six. Keeping his children submissive, the dignity that includes keeping his children submissive, uh, some would say that that means that all of the pastor's kids need to be followers of Jesus. And I, I do not believe that that's actually the best understanding of all of the content in the New Testament. I believe that all of the pastor's children must be living in submission to the order of the home under the leadership of their father and their mother, but not, not believers, I believe they must be faithful so that there can be no accusation that the management has fallen apart in that home that would undermine Christ and undermine the story of the gospel. Does that make sense? As a leader within the church family. So I think that this translation here helps us with that. It is not a child that is believing, but it is a child that is living in submission, not open to the accusation of debauchery or outright rebellion, which would call into question the family or the household administration of that particular pastor. So households are intended to be litmus tests. And I don't believe this teaches that all the pastors have to be parents either. I just believe that the household management is intended to be something that can be observed. So if it is before there's kids, there should be a management that's observable because that's where we find our confidence that there would be any management for all the other households. So whether it is a young family or an older family, whether it's a family like mine that we have five of us total, or it's a family like Jared's that has 17 and has a bus. (laughs) They have bathrooms in their vehicle. That's how many people are on there. That's not the issue. The issue is how is it being managed? What's happening at the home has everything to do with what we should expect to happen in our church family. It doesn't mean that it's fully developed, but it is in process of seeing this manifested so that nothing can stick to it. And why is it so important? Because verse five says, for someone does not know how to manage his own household, steward his house, how will he care? That word matters, care matters, care for God's church. That word is only used two times in the New Testament. Care for God's church. You know what the pastors of our Christ church are supposed to be doing? Luke chapter 10 and verse 34, that is the good Samaritan caring for the man who has been beaten and left along the side of the road. It's the only other time it's used. That is a care for that man. That's the life that we live. And if the management of the home is not there, it ought not to be entrusted for the care of God's church. And we take this so seriously. We take it so seriously that as a team, we regularly remind each other that if something's going difficult at home, it's fine to roll off the team to put a focus on home. That, that's totally okay. We, we want that because this is such a necessary part of how we function as a pastoral team. The family is so critical to the mission. And church, listen to me. The family is under attack. Your family is under attack. Marriage, as God intended it. Parenting, as God intended it. Being a child, as God intended it. It's all over your New Testament. 
Don't listen to the world. Listen to the word and watch your leaders. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what God intended, not with sinless perfection, but with a biblical direction of household administration while we're all together. Understand? Amen? I feel like so much parenting wisdom, so much marriage wisdom is like YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. Sweet mercy. Get back to the word of God and trust the one who instituted this to know what it should be like. Okay, that's number three. Let's go to number four. I said these would be quick and that was not quick. All right, number four. Our pastors must all have spiritual maturation before us. Pretty simple here. Not a recent convert. Not recently becoming a Christian. Maybe you're not a Christian. You're like, what is, that's a convert. You know that word. Uh, That doesn't mean just some kind of human interaction where you sign a paper and you become a Christian. This is a huge moment. This is when you become aware of your sin. This is what we've all become aware of. We see our sin. We know we're sinners. And we know that there's no other hope except for the finished work of Jesus for us as a savior for our soul. No other sinner can pay our penalty and we can't work our way out of our sin. The wage of our sin is death. And we have a holy creator who will judge us in his justice. This convert word right here, this is when we see that sin and we run to Jesus. We place our faith in Jesus. We trust Jesus. We believe Jesus is the answer for our sin. He came and lived a perfect sinless life that was required of us that we could not live. He died in substitution death and he rose victorious from the grave on the third day, never to die again. That's what convert means. It means that the spirit of God opens our eyes to see our sin. And maybe he's doing that for you today. You're going like, I don't think I'm okay. There's a sin issue here. That's the main problem. And there's only one remedy. There's only one savior for your soul. His name is Jesus. You must trust him. That's what this is. But if that's just recently happened, you should not then be given the responsibility for the oversight, bishop, elder, pastor of the church family in which you are living. So before I get off that, friends, if you don't know Christ, you must have Jesus. You don't have to pray a magic prayer. You don't have to clean up your life. Come the way you are. Confess your sin. Place your faith in him. He will save you. Amen, church? Friends, he will save you. Come with us. Church family... We need to make sure that there's spiritual maturation in the leadership that leads us. Why? Because without it, if leaders are placed too soon into this role, they may become puffed up with conceit, inflated view of self, and fall into the condemnation of the devil who was delusional and wanted to be equal with God. So had to be put out of the presence of God. This would be the corollary then, would be to be put out of the leadership responsibility because it was given too early without spiritual maturation. Does this make sense? You understand what I'm saying? Paul Tripp wrote a book called Dangerous Calling about pastoral leadership. He said this, quote, maturity is about how you live your life. It is possible to be theologically astute and very immature. It is possible to be biblically literate and be in need of significant spiritual growth, end quote. This is a spiritual maturation that is not merely intellectual, but has actually affected the life of those who give leadership in our church family. And this is for all of us. Do you know that maturity is what's going on here? Second Corinthians chapter three and verse 18, we're being changed into the more and more likeness to Jesus. Every time we engage with him, his spirit is affecting us. He's working on us. Colossians 1, 28, Paul's emphasis was to present every man mature in Christ so that we're growing up as brothers and sisters in this family into mature adulthood spiritually. That's what we're after. And those who are leading us under Christ must be those who are already carrying enough maturation that we can follow that example as we develop that's what's intended and number five last one our pastors must all have faithful reputation beyond us well thought of by outsiders is such an important final word in Ephesus there could be no accusation that would stick outside of the church family for those who would be giving leadership to the church family same here There is a desperate situation involved in being thought of well by outsiders. Look at verse seven in your Bible. Don't don't wrap up yet. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. Why? So that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. There are traps set in the community. Apart from our gathering, apart from our life together, there are traps set 
and there is disgrace to be walked into in the life that we live in the community in which we live. So leadership is not merely to be tested within, but is also to be considered without faithful reputation beyond our church. This summer, our family traveled overseas. And I don't know the last time you were over international where you don't have the language. I mean, the first thing you think all the time is we're Americans and we don't belong here. And I think that's what they're thinking. And you know, it's like, I'm an American asking for a bathroom. That's what I feel. That's what, that's what I, I'm American asking for. And they look at you when you're trying to say something to them, they look at you and they go, American? <laughs> like, yes, yes, can you help me? Like, American, don't know language. American, need bathroom now. <laughs> I'm trying to think of all the words I can think of for bathroom and I've got nothing. I got bathroom, that's what I got. Washroom. The pastors of our church family are always pastors. This is not categorical. There's not a place where we're pastors, but then we're not pastors. Do we rest? Absolutely. Do we take breaks from the normal responsibilities of life? For sure. And when we rest, we rest as pastors. And when we take breaks, we take breaks as pastors. We are pastors in our work. We are pastors when we're not working. We're pastors in our recreation. We're pastors in our chores at home. We're pastors in our traveling. We're pastors in our neighboring with our neighbors. We are pastors even at sporting events. We are pastors. Disqualification from the high office of pastoral leadership depends on no other life. There's no second life that would create a below reproach stickiness that could have an accusation attached to it. Does that make sense? Faithful reputation beyond us, okay? The Bible clearly defines the standard of leadership for the church. Let me give you two things to take home. Number one, am I actually being led in the church? I'm a little nervous that some are just content to go to a church. You're not actually a part of the church. So this leadership is not really something you're concerned about. And I just wanna tell you that the spirit of God intended... And Jesus intends for you to be known. That's why we have formal membership for you to be a part of and involved with. And I know there's scars involved. I know there's muscle memory involved. I know all that, but let's walk by faith and let's actually be led and engage as a church family. Some of you are around a lot of Christians, but you're not actually following Christ. It's not what you're doing. You're just around Christians. And some of you are going to a church, but you're not a part of a church. That's why we announce consider so much to help invite you in to being a part of the church with us so that we walk together as God intended. Hebrews 13, again, brings that home to us. Number two question is how does this passage benefit the mission? You may think, well, this doesn't benefit the mission. This is all about internal stuff. This isn't about external at all. It absolutely is about external because our life together as a church is intended to be an opportunity for us to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. What is going on over there in your church life? What kind of diversity is loving each other like that? Are you kidding? You're submitting to leadership? Why are you submitting to those leaders? What is going on here? Is an opportunity for gospel interaction. I follow Jesus Christ and he's the head of the church and he's ordained this particular leadership structure and I'm following and I have unity and we enjoy it. All of this is an opportunity for us to speak of the transforming power of the gospel because of this text, not in spite of this text. Think through that. Let the spirit of God process that with you. Talk about, talk about that with friends uh, from the church family and watch what God can do for the mission. Okay, not just someone leading a specific kind. And the Bible clearly defines that kind. Amen? Amen. All right, this is important stuff and uh, it is so necessary for our lives. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this portion that you've given us to study today. And I pray that where we need changed in our thinking, you would do it. Where our lives need affected, you would do it. Where our, our courage needs refounded, that you would do it. Give us fresh faith to walk in as we submit to leadership and and those of us who carry this particular responsibility as we lead. And I pray for our friends that don't know you, that you would draw them to Christ. Jesus, may we follow you together in every way that you have ordered for us, for our good, for our flourishing, for the mission to go forward. We wanna do it, trusting you, looking to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. May the bread and the cup remind us of the cost of our discipleship 
We pray this in your name. Amen.